Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. I hope you're all doing super, super well. Today we're gonna be talking about the murders of four University of Idaho students, Kaylee Gonsalves, Madison Mogan, Zana Kernoodle, and Ethan Chapin. This is a pretty recent case, and I'm sure the majority of you guys are already familiar with what happened. This case has really taken over the internet and has reached people all over the world. I mean, I know people in Mexico and people in Europe that are keeping up with the investigation, and I think one of the reasons why this case just really blew up is First of all, because it's very frightening hearing about what happened to these young college kids that had so much to live for and, you know, we're just having fun in college. It truly is frightening and it just really makes you open your eyes and realize that life is just so short and that something can happen at any time. Now, another reason why this case really blew up is because of the internet. And while the internet can be a good thing, it can also be a bad thing. This case brought out a lot of like internet detectives. Some people were more focused on making up conspiracy theories and making these crazy accusations against people instead of actually caring about the victims and about what actually happened. Now, the way that I found out about this case was actually through TikTok. A video showed up on my For You page and it was this TikToker who was analyzing an interview that Kaylee's older sister, Olivia, had done. And they were basically talking about this interview and saying, wow, this girl looks so suspicious. Like the sister's behavior is very odd. And when I went to go read the comments, I was surprised to see that a lot of people were agreeing with her. And since I didn't really know anything about what happened, as I started reading more about the case, I literally was shocked at the fact that someone made that video and that people were accusing the sister of being suspicious. We'll go into that a little bit more later, you know, about the internet and how people have just gone really crazy trying to be, you know, TikTok detectives. Real quick, I just want to thank you guys so much for being here and for listening to today's video. There's a lot of information to go over. So with that, let's jump right into today's video. Let's start off by talking about Kaylee Gonsalves. This YouTuber called The Chronicles of Olivia did an interview with Kaylee's family and I highly recommend that you guys go watch it. It was a very good interview and I felt like it was very real and authentic. Kaylee's family was able to just sit down and talk about their daughter without being interrupted and it was a very good interview where they gave us a lot of insight into how amazing of a person Kaylee was. So I will link that video down below if you guys wanna check it out. Kaylee Gonsalves was born on June 8th, 2001 in Concord, California. She is the middle child out of five siblings, so she has an older sister, an older brother, and then she has two younger sisters. When Kaylee was about one years old, the Gonsalves family moved to North Idaho, and that's where Kaylee really grew into such a beautiful, kind, and happy person. If you go through Kaylee's social media, there is this radiance about her. She honestly seems like the most loving and just happiest person, and she just had this very infectious glow. She honestly seems like someone that you would want to have as your friend. She had this beautiful smile, she was so friendly to everyone and something quirky that her family noted about her is that she was really competitive She loved to shop She was obsessed with the store Claire's and in order to get money to buy herself things from there She would do chores around the house. So she would mop she would sweep she would clean the counters I mean she would do anything just to get five dollars and then take those five dollars to the mall and buy herself Accessories one time when her family went out to the lake They were all together and Kaylee's father Steve said I'll give five dollars to anyone who jumps in the water right now without even thinking about it Kaylee immediately jumped into the freezing cold water all for five dollars and that competitiveness that she had and that hustle mentality is something that her family really admired about her they just thought it was so funny how she was always willing to do anything and she just always wanted to keep up with her older siblings when Kaylee was in the sixth grade she met another girl named Madison Mogan from the day those two girls met they immediately became best friends Steve and Kaylee's mother Christy say that they still remember the day that Kaylee met Madison. One day Kaylee came home from school and she was telling her parents all about her new friend Maddie and how she really liked her and wanted to invite her to come over to hang out at her house. At that time, Maddie had pretty strict parents so her parents were like, okay, well if you wanna go hang out at Kaylee's house, like I need to speak to her parents first, I need to go visit the house. And Kaylee's family really wasn't like that but of course they were willing to meet with Maddie's family and you know make them feel comfortable because from that moment, Madison and Kaylee were 
were completely inseparable. The two girls would hang out at each other's house every single day. They would do homework together. They would go to the mall together. They would have sleepovers. They even got to the point where they would go on vacation with each other's families. That's how close these girls were. They experienced their first date together, their first boyfriends, their first heartbreak. I mean, these girls were practically sisters. They went to the same middle school together and then they convinced their parents to let them attend the same high school. And then lastly, they also attended the University of Idaho together. It is just so great to read about this friendship and how they pretty much went through every single stage of their lives together. I mean, imagine being with your best friend through middle school, then through high school, and then going to college with them. They even tried to join the same sorority. I believe they rushed for Alpha Pi, but only Kaylee got into that sorority, which of course made her upset because she wanted to be with her best friend. But it was still okay, even though they were separate and they were a part of different, you know, friend groups and different sororities, the girls continued to remain close. Yes, they made new friends and they experienced different things, but at the end of the day, these girls were sisters and their friendship was never going to change. So at the University of Idaho, Kaylee was studying to become an elementary school teacher and she had very good grades and was very studious. She took summer classes and because of that, she actually graduated early. Her graduation ceremony was set to take place in December of 2022. Since she graduated early, she didn't really need to be on campus anymore. She found an internship in Texas, so she grabbed all of her belongings and moved to Texas to start this new chapter of her life. She was so excited about this new job, this new state, this new city, and even after moving, Kaylee remained in constant contact with Maddie and they made plans to see each other again. Now let's move over and let's talk about who Maddie was. Madison Mogan was born on May 25th, 2001 in Eugene, Oregon. She spent her first two years of life in Eugene and then moved with her family to North Idaho, which is actually where her parents grew up. Maddie was an only child, so everything that she did was super important and very special to her parents. They absolutely adored their daughter and they just loved her so much. They say she was like an angel and they just admired everything that she did. Just like Kaylee, Maddie had such a radiant smile and glow. She is absolutely beautiful and her friends and family describe her as a genuinely good person. She loved to make other people laugh and she loved joking around. When she asked you about how your day was, she genuinely meant it. She genuinely wanted to know how you were doing and she was just such an authentic person. Her friends and family also describe her as being a very caring and hardworking person. She got really good grades in school. She never really had to worry about receiving a good letter of recommendation from her teachers because she just always did an amazing job. While attending the University of Idaho, she did get a part-time job working at a restaurant called The Mad Greek. So Maddie was a busy girl. She was balancing being part of a sorority. She was balancing a part-time job. She was balancing school. And she was also balancing having a boyfriend. She was dating a guy named Jay and they had a very close and loving relationship. They were together for over a year and he says that Maddie was just so funny and so goofy. Through Maddie's sorority, she met a lot of amazing people, including a girl named Zana Kernoodle. Let's talk about Zana. Zana was born on July 5th, 2002 in Post Falls, Idaho. Everyone described Zana as being very active and super athletic. Growing up, she played volleyball, soccer, and she was on the track team. She was also a very talented gymnast as a child and she just loved being outdoors and keeping herself busy. Her friends and family say that Zaina was a very positive person. She never really got angry. She always looked on the bright side and tried to remain positive. She didn't really worry about drama. She just liked to have fun and was living the best life possible. She had an older sister named Jasmine, whom she was very close to, along with her two parents. Zaina loved her dog. She loved EDM music. She enjoyed going to concerts with her friends and with her dad, and she just loved spending time with the people that she loved. At the University of Idaho, Zaina was majoring in marketing and she was a member of the same sorority as Maddie. Now, along with being a part of the same sorority, Zaina also worked at the Mad Greek with Maddie. So the two girls really did spend a lot of time together. Again, her plate was completely full and Zaina was very into school and she always put school first. She really put the time in to study for her classes, get good grades, and you know, that didn't really leave her with a lot of time to date. In fact, her sister and her dad often wondered if Zana would ever get a boyfriend because it just wasn't something that she normally talked about. However, in the spring of 2022, that all changed. This is when Zana met a boy named Ethan Chapin. Ethan Chapin was born at 4.43 p.m. on a Tuesday in October. And then just a minute later, his sister Maisie was born 
and then two minutes later, his brother Hunter was born. So Ethan was a triplet and he had such a close bond with his siblings. I mean, you can just imagine the type of relationship that triplets would have. They went through every single stage of their life together, going all the way from preschool to elementary school to middle school, high school, and in the end, going to college together. All three of the Chapin siblings attended the University of Idaho and the reason that they wanted to go there is because they wanted to experience kind of like the small town life and they also wanted to go to a university that had a very active Greek life. Ethan and Hunter joined the fraternity of Sigma Chi and then their sister Maisie joined Kappa Alpha Theta. So all three of them were very active in the Greek life and you know just thinking about all of them being together and experiencing college together it's just so beautiful and it really just warms my heart. Ethan was also very athletic and very active so growing up he played soccer, he played basketball, he did baseball, specifically enjoyed playing volleyball, going surfing, or playing pickleball. So maybe that's something him and Xana bonded over because they both enjoyed playing sports and were very athletic. Everyone describes Ethan as a very sweet and loving person. He seemed like this tall, tough guy, but everyone says that once you got to know him, he was actually this big, soft teddy bear. You would never see him angry, and he just loved hanging out with his friends, with his girlfriend, listening to country music, and just being happy. He had a very big social life, but he also remained very focused on his studies. I believe he was studying sports management and his parents were hoping that he would become a coach or, you know, maybe a gym teacher because he was very good with kids. And again, he was just an overall athletic person. So in the spring of 2022, Ethan and Xana met and they immediately hit it off. Everyone says that Ethan was so happy when he started dating Xana and that they were just the perfect couple. They were always happy. They were always smiling. They shared very cute photos of each other on social media and people just wanted to be around Ethan and Zayna because they just radiated so much love and happiness. Now even though Kaylee wasn't a part of the same sorority as Maddie and Zana and she also didn't work at the restaurant, Kaylee, Zana, and Maddie became very close. In fact the girls became so close that they all decided to move in together and rent a house on 1112 King Road in Moscow, Idaho. Now along with Kaylee, Maddie, and Zana, two other girls also moved into the house. Now in order to respect the two girls privacy I will be referring to the two other roommates as DM and BF. So in total there were five girls living in this three-story six-bedroom house. I'm gonna explain the layout of the house because it's a little bit confusing and this house has so many rooms and so many levels. So there are three floors. The bottom floor is ground level and that is where the driveway is and it also has the front door. There are two rooms in the bottom level and BF was staying in one of the rooms. Then on the second level there were two bedrooms, a bathroom, a living room, and a kitchen. This was the main living area and there was also a glass sliding door that led to the backyard which could also work as an entry point because the house was kind of like on a hill so if you just climbed up the hill you would be able to enter the house through this glass sliding door. So on the second floor roommate DM lived in one room and then Xana lived in the other room. Now Ethan didn't live at this house but he would often spend the night there with his girlfriend Xana. Lastly on the third level there were two bedrooms and a bathroom. These bedrooms belonged to Kaylee and Maddie. There was a balcony in one of the bedrooms that you could maybe get to if you climbed on it but it wasn't super accessible so the two main entry points of this house were on the first floor through the front door or on the second floor through the glass sliding door. And this house was kind of like a party house but not in a bad way. I mean these kids are in college, they're having fun, they're enjoying their youth so obviously they're gonna have parties and hang out with their friends. So people would be coming and going from this house all the time and there was actually a couple of instances when police arrived to the house because neighbors were complaining about the noise and about the music and things like that. So there is actually footage of police arriving to the house and speaking to Zayna. There's other footage of police arriving another time speaking to Kaylee and nothing bad happened. I mean, they were basically just asking the girls if they could turn down the music or if they could, you know, kick people out and keep things quiet. The main reason why police were going were because of noise complaints. What's your name? Xana. Xana, do you live here? Yes. Hey, did Megan talk to you earlier? I, no. Okay, does Megan live here? Megan, I do not have a Megan that lives Megan here. Mogan? Maddie oh, Mogan, yes. Madison Mogan, yeah. Madison Mogan, okay, she does Sorry, live here. Sorry, we, she is at the club. She's 21, I'm just going to bed. I have a couple friends over, but okay. this is my idea. Have you talked to Maddie tonight? 
Yes, I have. Well, She's at the cl corner club. Okay. Did she did she tell you anything about anything that happened earlier or anything like that? Honestly, not really. <clears throat> I'm I've just been here the past hour. Okay. Okay. Just trying to go to bed. Can and, I grab your ID for me? If yeah, I'm her. not 21. I'm okay. My roommates are 21. I just came well, to go to bed. We're, we're not here for we're not here to talk about the alcohol stuff, okay? Okay, yeah. Um, but th this is the second noise complaint we've had here tonight within two hours. I'm sorry okay? about that. So this time it was the blonde gal and the guy on the back porch oh, so playing music, okay? So I sincerely apologize about okay. that. I, I'm just going to bed. Okay. And when you watch the footage of the cops arriving to the house, you can honestly see how isolated and how dark this house was. I mean, there are basically no outdoor lights. So if you're kind of going up the hill, going to where the glass sliding door is, it is literally super dark there. And the road where this house was, was kind of like a dead end. It was kind of like a cul-de-sac. So if you were going on that street, it's because you were going to visit one of these houses or maybe you got Got lost and we're gonna do a u-turn so there really isn't a lot of heavy traffic on that street I'm not sure about all the roommates but I did see an interview where Kaylee's family says that Kaylee always locked the door even when she would go back home to visit her parents at their house she always made sure to have the door locked so that was super important to her and again I'm not sure about the other roommates if they locked the door or if they didn't really worry about it okay so now that we know the layout of the house let's talk about what actually happened on the night of November 12th so at this point, Kaylee was already living in Texas because she had secured a new job. So she wasn't living at the house in the moment, but she decided to go visit her best friends that weekend because, you know, she wanted to catch up with Maddie and all of her other friends. Plus she had just bought herself a new Range Rover. So she wanted to show her friends her new car. So she decided to go down to Idaho that weekend to visit her friends and stay inside that house. Now she had a dog named Murphy that she shared with her ex-boyfriend Jack. So when she came to Idaho to visit her friends, she she brought Murphy along with her. So on Saturday night, November 12th, Kaylee posted this photo on her Instagram, which shows all of the roommates together, including Ethan. And she put the caption, one lucky girl to be surrounded by these people every day. Maddie is sitting on Kaylee's shoulders. Ethan and Zana are standing next to each other, smiling. And it's just such a beautiful photo. And it's just so hard to see that photo of them smiling and looking all happy. And they had no idea about what was going to happen later that night. So the roommates DM and BF went off to do their own thing and then Kaylee and Madison decided to kind of have their own little girls night. They started off by going to a party with a bunch of other college students and then at around 10 p.m. the two 21 year old girls headed over to the local bar called The Corner Club. This bar is located at 202 North Main Street which is about a six minute drive from the girls house on King Road. From what Kaylee's family has said the girls used a private service to drive them around that night. This is someone that the family trusted and that the girls trusted. I don't know if it was like an Uber or a Lyft or you know another private service. No, the girls were being responsible. They weren't drinking and driving that night. They weren't alone. They had the buddy system in place and you know they were keeping their family updated on how their night was going. So the girls get to the corner club and they were there for a couple of hours. Then at around 1 40 in the morning Maddie and Kaylee decided to walk over to this food truck that was very popular to the university students. This food truck is called the Grub Truck and this Grub Truck was just a couple of blocks away from the Corner Club. Since it was just going to be a quick walk, the girls decided to go on foot instead of having the driver take them. There is footage of Kaylee and Maddie's interaction at this Grub Truck. So it turns out that the Grub Truck normally live streams on Twitch, I think every single night to promote their business. So that specific night they were live streaming and you can actually hear Kaylee and Maddie arrive the girls order their food. I think they were ordering like a carbonara and they were there for just like a couple of minutes. There were a lot of other people at the food truck. Like I said, it's a very popular spot for the university students. Kaylee was on her phone and Maddie was speaking to a couple of other friends that she knew. Then after getting their food, the girls call their private driving service and the private driver takes the girls back to their home on King Road. They got there at about 1.56 in the morning on Sunday, November 13th. When they got 
home, Kaylee called her ex-boyfriend Jack seven times between 2.26 in the morning and 2.44 in the morning. Now, a lot of people have speculated about these calls, but Kaylee's family honestly believes that she was just, you know, drunk dialing her ex-boyfriend. You know, they were trying to get back together and were thinking about starting their relationship again. Some of those calls were also made on Maddie's phone. So I think these were just like harmless calls. So that was a timeline for Kaylee and Madison. And as for Zayna and Ethan, they were also off doing their own thing. Ethan and Zayna went to a party together at a fraternity house that was just a couple of blocks away from the King's Road house so I believe the couple actually walked to that house and you know they went there to hang out have some fun with their friends and they came back to the house at around 1 45 in the morning now again Ethan did not live at this house but most nights he would stay with his girlfriend and on that specific night that's what he did as for the other roommates DM and BF they also had their own night and they arrived back to the house at around 1 o'clock in the morning so they say that by 2 a.m all the roommates plus Ethan were back at the house and you know presumably getting ready to go to sleep so the night continues and Zana ended up ordering some food through DoorDash and the driver got to the house at around four o'clock in the morning and this driver says that he physically handed the bag to Zana. Zana grabbed her food and then went back upstairs to her bedroom which was again located on the second floor so Kaylee and Maddie are sleeping in the upstairs bedroom DM is sleeping on her bedroom on the second floor Zana and Ethan are sleeping in their bedroom on the second floor and then the final roommate was sleeping on the third floor in their own bedroom. DM says that she woke up at around four o'clock in the morning because she heard what she thought was Kaylee playing with her dog Murphy. Now along with hearing what she thought was Kaylee playing with her dog Murphy, she also heard who she thought was Kaylee saying something to the effect of there's someone here. As soon as she heard that, she opened her bedroom door, she looked around but she didn't see anything. So she closed her door and tried to go back to sleep. Now even though she believes that Kaylee was the one that said there's someone here. Police also believe that it might have been Xana because she was still awake at this point. Her phone records show that around 4 12 in the morning her TikTok was active so she could have been scrolling on TikTok or she could have fallen asleep and the TikTok app could have kept going while she was sleeping. Either way roommate DM went back to sleep however she was woken up a second time when she thought she heard crying coming from Xana's bedroom. So she got up and she heard a male voice say it's okay I'm going to help you. DM thought that this was strange so she opened her bedroom door and this time she saw something. She saw a male wearing black clothing and a mask that covered their nose and their mouth walking towards her. She describes a guy as 5'10 or taller, not very muscular but athletically built and with bushy eyebrows. The male walked past DM as she stood in her doorway frozen in place. She could not move but this man did not see her and he just walked past her towards the sliding glass door and then left the house. After seeing this, DM immediately closed her door, locked herself inside, and I don't know if she went back to bed, I don't know if she went to go hide somewhere in her room, but this was a very frightening moment for her and she says that she just went in complete shock. So while all of that was happening inside the house, a neighbor's camera did capture audio at around 4.17 in the morning. The camera picked up sounds of a dog barking and a distorted audio audio of what sounded like voices or you know someone whimpering followed by a loud thud. Later that morning, roommates BF and DM called over some friends because they thought that one of the victims that was on the second floor had passed out and weren't waking up. They were worried, so they called some friends to come over to see if they could help the situation. But after realizing that this was probably a more serious situation, they decided to call the police at around 11.58 in the morning. They phoned the police and requested help for an unconscious person. And when they got to the house, they came across a horrific scene. Zayna was found lying on the floor inside her bedroom dead. Just a couple of feet away from her was also her boyfriend Ethan Chapin and the two of them had been stabbed to death. Police officers then went upstairs to the third floor and when they walked inside Kaylee's room they found her dog Murphy. Murphy was completely fine. He wasn't harmed. He was just laying on Kaylee's bed. After this police went over to Maddie's bedroom and that's when they found Maddie and Kaylee inside the room lying on her bed dead. Both girls had also been stabbed to death. 
The police officers say that coming across that scene was just absolutely horrific and so traumatizing. Just walking in and seeing these young kids just stabbed to death and brutally murdered is just so hard and something that they're never going to forget. After speaking to the two surviving roommates, police believe that the murders happened sometime between 4 o'clock in the morning and 4.25 in the morning. Which is crazy that these four people were murdered in just under 25 minutes. They tried to check to see if someone had broken into the house or, you know, to see how this person got inside, but they didn't find any signs of forced entry. People around the community immediately started hearing about the deaths of these four students. The word started to spread so much that at this point, some of the family members were finding out from the public before they found out from the police. I know for Kaylee's parents, they found out through another family member. It was around 1 p.m. On Sunday when they were all sitting together watching football like any other family does when all of a sudden Kaylee's mother Christy received a call from her niece. Her niece was on the other line and she was panicking, she was freaking out and she told Christy I think Kaylee's dead and as soon as Christy heard that she says that her stomach just dropped. She could not believe that these words were coming out of her niece's mouth and she just didn't understand how this was real life. She said she just threw her phone and she told Steve and the rest of the siblings you know, I think Kaylee's like we need to figure out what's happening. Everyone else in the family also couldn't believe it. Steve was like, no, like there's no way that this happened. Like let's call Maddie. I'm sure if something had happened, Maddie would have told us by now. So they started phone calling Maddie and obviously Maddie also wasn't picking up the phone. That's when Christy turned on the news channel and that's when she saw it. She saw the news station standing outside the house and she could see that her daughter's car was still in the driveway. She also saw Maddie's car there. At first the news was reported that an unconscious person was found inside the house. So after hearing that, Christy figured, okay, like maybe there's still a chance that she's okay if it was an unconscious person. She was just trying to remain hopeful that Kaylee was still okay. At this point, the police had not contacted the Gonzalez family. They hadn't contacted Steve. They hadn't contacted Christy. They hadn't called them to let them know, like, your daughter is yet the news was already talking about this and other people around campus were talking about this calling Kaylee's siblings and calling her sisters and her brother letting them know your sister is dead so at this point, Steve was feeling frustrated and he was feeling confused because he just didn't know what the truth was. So he called the Moscow Police Department and said, my daughter is Kaylee. People are telling me that my daughter is dead. Like, is this true? The Moscow Police Department told him, we can't give you any more information, but we'll call you back. Can you imagine getting calls from friends and family members telling you that your daughter is dead? and you're seeing it on the news as well. Yet when you call the police from that area, they tell you that they can't give you any more information about it and that they'll call you back. I understand that there's protocols in place and I understand that police have a way of doing things, but at the same time, I feel like we have to understand how the families felt in that moment and how families in the future will feel if they're put in that same position. Imagine not being able to confirm if your child is actually dead not. Steve was just so angry and he just says that these protocols need to change. There has to be a better way to notify loved ones about their loss. Since they weren't able to get in contact with Maddie, with Kaylee, with Zayna, with anyone, they decided to call Maddie's mom, Karen, and see if she knew anything. And Karen picked up the phone and told the Gonzalez family that yes, the police had contacted her and told her to come down to Idaho to the house because there was an accident. So after hearing that, Kaylee's family Family assumed that maybe Maddie was the unconscious person and maybe she was the one that was in an accident, not Kaylee. Kaylee's older sister, Olivia, was doing her best to be there for her parents. At this point, she was living in Los Angeles and her parents were still living in Idaho, so she wasn't physically there to help calm them down and, you know, help in the situation. But she was telling her parents over the phone, listen, if Kaylee did die last night, you guys would have been notified way sooner. Maybe it was just an accident. Maybe Maddie is unconscious and the reason Kaylee isn't answering her phone is because they're interrogating her or, you know, things like that. She was just trying to come up with any reason as to why Kaylee wouldn't be picking up the phone. Every single hour, Olivia was just refreshing the internet to see if there was more updates on this. I just think it's so sad how she had to depend on the internet to find out news about her sister and wasn't able to get this information directly from the police. Hours went by before police finally arrived to their door and told them face to face that their daughter was dead. 
And Steve just feels like that is so wrong that they had to wait hours in panic, you know, not knowing what the truth was, not knowing where their daughter was. I mean, they still continue to call Kaylee's cell phone, to call Maddie's cell phone and try to get some answers. And it just breaks my heart that the families had to go through that for so many hours without knowing the truth. And they couldn't even call Maddie's mom, Karen, because she was in the middle of driving to Idaho. And I guess a police protocol is to not tell the family members right away in case you know they try to commit suicide or in case they, you know, do something that might harm themselves or might harm others. So they told Kaylee's family to not call Maddie's mom. So Maddie's mom was driving this entire way without even knowing if her daughter was dead or what really happened. It wasn't until she actually got to the house that police finally told her the truth and told her, I'm sorry, but your daughter is dead. Now, as for Zayna's dad, he says that the moment that he found out his daughter was dead, everything around him just stopped. He had spoken to his daughter at around midnight the night before. So to think that he spoke to his daughter just like a couple of hours before she was brutally murdered, it's just so hard for him to process that and understand how that actually happened. Jeffrey says that Zana was in constant communication with her family. So again, they were texting the night before she was murdered and nothing seemed unusual. I mean, he says that Zana would always lock the door as well. There was a number code for the door, which was always on. So he just doesn't understand how someone came inside this house and did this to these girls and to Ethan, especially because police didn't find any signs of forced entry. And he just doesn't understand and why? Like, why Xana? And I'm sure when Ethan's parents found out, they were just as heartbroken and just as confused. It just breaks my heart to think about these families and how they probably found out through the news before they found out through the police. Everyone was just struggling to understand how this happened. They were also concerned because the killer hadn't been caught yet. Police said that there were no signs of forced entry. They had no suspects. The families were concerned that police weren't going to find the but police were doing everything that they could to find evidence, find information, and track down on a suspect. After the bodies were discovered, police started reviewing surveillance footage around the area to see if maybe they could capture someone on camera that, you know, pulled up to the house or was watching the house or something like that. Or, you know, just to see if they could notice anything suspicious. And as they started looking at surveillance footage from around the area, they did find something odd. They saw that a white Hyundai Elantra passed by the house three times before entering the area for a fourth time at 4.04 in the morning. Then at about 4.20 in the morning, this white Hyundai Elantra could, could be seen on video footage speeding away from the neighborhood. And again, this house is kind of like on a dead end street. So a lot of cars don't normally pass by that street. And if you are on that street, it's because you're looking for a house or because you're lost. However, this car literally passed by three times until finally passing by a fourth time. So with that information, police thought that this car might know something. Maybe they were the suspect or maybe they were just a witness to what happened that night. After reviewing the footage on December 7th, police announced to the public that they were looking to speak with a driver of a white 2011 to 2013 Hyundai Elantra that was seen in the immediate area of the victim's house early on November 13th. They asked that anyone with information on the car to contact the tip line. Now, along with finding that surveillance footage of the white Hyundai Elantra, police also recovered a tan leather knife sheath that was found near Madison and Kaylee body. According to the affidavit, this knife sheath was lying on the bed next to Maddie and Kaylee. So detectives grabbed the item, they sent it over to a forensic lab, and they were able to find DNA on this knife sheath. However, at the time, they did not reveal this to the public. They were super hush-hush about things that they were finding in the moment because, of course, they needed to protect the integrity of the investigation. If they just go out there and they start revealing to the public everything that they know, it could tip off the kill or the killers and potentially harm the investigation. So at this point, the public did not know that there was DNA found on this knife sheath. Along with the knife sheath, police also found a footprint outside of DM's bedroom, which they believe belongs to the intruder. Now, as for the autopsies, they were conducted on November 17th and they determined that all four victims were stabbed multiple times. Ethan, Zana, Kaylee, and Maddie were probably asleep when they were attacked. Now, even though police did not recover murder weapons, 
weapon at the crime scene, they did recover the knife sheath. So with that information and with what the autopsies concluded, police suspect that a Kabar style knife may have been used to kill the four victims. Jeffrey, Zana's dad, said that his daughter had apparently tried to fight her attacker. And this was actually backed up by the coroner, Kathy, who conducted the autopsies. At first, she came out and said that one of the victims did have defensive wounds, but then Jeffrey came out and said that that victim was his daughter. He says that there's one thing that the autopsy shows for certain, and that is that Zaina is a strong-willed woman who fought her killer to the very end. And just thinking about how Zayna fought back and what she had to go through is just so haunting. I know there's a lot of rumors out there and speculation of what actually happened and, you know, if Zayna was still awake, if she was actually on TikTok, if, you know, who got killed first and things like that. And I just think that some details don't need to, like, be made public like we're allowed to let things just remain private to the family and i saw that there was a new article that came out i believe today or yesterday that was talking about how Zana was the last person to die and that she saw ethan die before her just all this crazy stuff that i don't want to repeat and i just want to say that if you are reading you know articles out there and things like that just be careful with what you're consuming because a lot of these just say you know this comes from a trusted source and i feel like mm, i don't know if you can really trust that if police haven't come out and stated that information or the family hasn't come out and stated that information, I would be careful with what you take in. On Wednesday, November 30th, friends and families of the victims gathered together to you know, talk about who Kaylee was as a person, who Zana was, who Ethan was, who Maddie was, and you know, just bring up memories of them that they enjoy and just talk about how amazing these four kids truly were. Ethan's mother, Stacy, spoke at this vigil and she told everyone, we are eternally grateful that we have spent so much time with Ethan. That's the most important message that we have for you and for your family, to make sure that you spend as much time as possible with those people because time is precious and it's something that you can't get back. She also said that her kids are so thankful that they had the time to spend with Ethan before his death. He was literally the life of the party. He made everybody laugh and he was just such a kind person. Stacy said she appreciated all the love and support that she was receiving from the community and you know from people all over the world because again this case really hit the news and people all across the country were finding out about what happened to these four for victims and everyone was sending all of their condolences and all of their prayers and thoughts to the family. So, you know, Stacy and the rest of the families really did appreciate that love and that support. When it was time for Kaylee's family to speak, Steve said something that really just tugged at my heart and it makes it so hard to not cry when saying it because it is just so emotional and it just breaks your heart. He started talking about the friendship that Kaylee and Maddie had together and he said, they've been best friends since sixth grade. They went to high school school together and then they went to college together and then they moved into the same apartment together and in the end they died together in the same room in the same bed and it's such a shame and it hurts but the beauty of the two always being together is something that will comfort us and let us know that they were with their best friend in the whole world again just reading that makes you so emotional because that friendship is just so beautiful and what he's saying is so true you know they were best friends since they were in sixth grade they did everything together and in the end they were together in their death and I'm happy that does bring the family some type of comfort to know that they weren't alone and that at least they had each other. I don't believe Zana's family was at the visual but Maddie's family was and her father was up there speaking and again every single family just really tugs at your heart and especially because Maddie was an only child. Maddie's parents literally lost their only child and he was up there talking about how proud he was of his daughter and how the two of them loved attending concerts together and how everything that Maddie did was so perfect and he just admired her so much. At this vigil, they did read a letter that came from the two surviving roommates, DM and BF. They weren't there in person because I'm sure that they were already dealing with so much. Imagine knowing that your roommates inside your house were brutally murdered and that you survived. It's just crazy to me. And honestly, we'll get to the roommates in a little bit because I do want to talk about them and how the public has completely scrutinized them for no reason. But I can just imagine that going to this vigil was going to be very hard for them. So instead of being there in person, they did write this letter that was read out loud by the priest. In the letter, they talked about Ethan and Zana's relationship and how it was just unstoppable and perfect. They also went on to talk about all four of the victims and 
said, quote, you were all gifts to this world in your own special way and it just won't be the same without you. The murders of Ethan, Zana, Kaylee, and Maddie just really broke the community of Moscow, Idaho, as well as the families and as well as the people that attended the university, especially because they hadn't caught the killer yet. So people were on edge. People were scared. People were scared to be home alone. People were scared to live there, to go to school, to go to work. At first, since police didn't really know what happened, they didn't know if this was targeted. They didn't know if this was random. I mean, they didn't know what happened. So they put out a message telling all students to you know, go home, lock their doors, remain vigilant and be safe. Because again, they didn't know if this guy was going to attack again. After gathering some more information, police said that they didn't believe that there was an ongoing risk to the community based on the information that they had gathered during the preliminary investigation. So after gathering that information, police told the public that this was an isolated, targeted attack and that there was no imminent threat to the community at large. However, even after hearing from the police that they didn't think the public was in danger, people were still scared. Kids left campus, they left their housing, and they went back to go live with their parents. People stopped going to class in person. They started going to class online. People were just really scared about this, and I 100% understand their point of view. On top of being scared that there was a killer still out there that had just murdered these four college kids, some of them were also grieving the loss of their friends. You know, Kaylee, Maddie, Zana, and Ethan were very social people that had a lot of friends in the community and a lot of friends at the university. So a lot of their classmates were grieving the loss of them and it was just such a difficult time for everyone in the community. So going back to what I was talking about at the start of the video about how this case really took over the internet and how people really started to blow up and make conspiracies and you know make all these crazy theories about you know who could have done this or why this had happened. This case just really went viral on TikTok specifically. I know it was also popular on Twitter and Facebook and Reddit. Of course, there was a million Reddit threads about this. So while the internet can be a great place to bring awareness and to keep the momentum going, I also felt like like a lot of people started to become very entitled in a way. I saw so many videos on TikTok about people saying, oh my gosh, like we're gonna solve this case faster than the police. Like we as TikTok detectives need to come together and solve this. There were so many Facebook groups. I believe there was one that had like over 200,000 members inside. Inside this group, of course, there are good people that try to, you know, remain positive and keep the focus on the victims. But there are also people on there that just go and make the most craziest theories that you've ever ever heard in your life and just think that everyone is guilty and that they deserve to like know more than the families. You know, obviously police can't reveal too much information because they need to maintain the integrity of the investigation. So police weren't revealing everything to the public and this made people angry. People felt like they had a right to know more than the police, than the news, than the families. I saw people complaining about how they didn't have any crime scene photos, which I'm like, why would you want to see that? Like, why do you want to see their body? Bodies and why do you want to see all of that? I don't understand. But I saw people complaining about that. People were complaining about the fact that they didn't know, you know, who died first or, you know, who died where or, you know, things like that. And I saw people criticize the police and the families for not releasing this information to the public. People were defending themselves by saying, we have a right to know as well. I know I'm getting like all worked up about it, but it just makes me so angry. It just breaks my heart because if you go to that YouTube channel I was telling you guys about, The Chronicles of Olivia, and you you listen to Kaylee's family's interview, you can hear how much they, I don't want to say fear, but how, you know, kind of like resentment towards the public because anything that they did, they were immediately judged on. For example, people were making videos about Kaylee's older sister, Olivia, and claiming that she was suspicious, that she was guilty, that she was involved, that she was weird. People were focusing on her at first. And then I saw videos of people literally saying that Kaylee's father, Steve, was the killer. And these people were serious because other people would comment agreeing with the TikToker. I feel like if you're gonna be sharing things online and if you're gonna be talking about things, it's because you wanna raise awareness and because you actually want justice and wanna help, not because you just wanna make all these crazy rumors up about who may be guilty. So in that interview that Kaylee's family did on the Chronicles of Olivia, they were literally talking about how the public would criticize them for how they were breathing, for how their eyes moved, for their body language. And you could tell that Kaylee's father, Steve, was so annoyed about this 
this. He literally said like, listen, if you're a family that ever has to deal with this and unfortunately your loved one becomes a victim of homicide and you try to be public about it, just know that people are gonna scrutinize you, people are gonna judge you, people are gonna insult you, people are gonna tear you apart and you have to be ready for that. And just hearing Steve say that broke my heart because he should be receiving all the love and support in the world right now from the public. And while there is so much love and there is so much kindness, there also are those people that just ruin it and it's so hard to focus on the positive people when there's these negative people just judging you for everything that you do. People were literally judging Kaylee's father and Kaylee's sister Olivia for being so public and for doing, you know, interviews and, you know, doing segments on TV. People thought it was weird that they were being so vocal and there are consequences for acting this way. There's actually this TikToker named Ashley who is getting sued by an assistant professor at the university who chairs the school's history department. I believe the teacher's name is Rebecca and she filed a defamation lawsuit against the TikToker Ashley because this TikToker, who I believe is a tarot card reader or she like reads cards and she somehow believed that this professor, Rebecca, was the one that made this whole plan up. Like she thinks that she hired, I believe it's Kaylee's ex-boyfriend, Jack to kill the girls and to kill Ethan. How this woman came to that conclusion, I have no idea, but she made so many videos talking about this and accusing this professor of being the killer that the professor has now filed a lawsuit against her. And I think that's amazing because you can't just be throwing these crazy accusations at people without thinking that you're gonna have consequences. So this just shows that, you know, you have to be careful with what you're spreading online and just be careful with what information you take in. Some people on social media were absolutely terrible tearing apart the two surviving roommates, specifically DM. People were going after DM and I believe they've already like found her real name and they found her Instagram and all this stuff. And people were just telling her that she was a horrible person because she didn't call the police right away because she didn't go help them because this and that. And my heart just absolutely breaks for DM and for BF. I mean, they have to live with this for the rest of their lives. They literally have to live with the fact that their three roommates plus Plus their boyfriend were brutally murdered inside their home while they were there. Especially DM. She literally heard someone crying. She heard someone say, there's someone here. She heard a male voice say, I'm going to help you. And then she literally saw the killer leave the house. I just feel so bad for these girls and I truly hope that they're doing okay and that they're going to get the help that they need to overcome this. We cannot blame DM because you have no idea how you would react in that situation. Everyone is saying, I would have called the police right away. I would have done this. I would have fought back. I would have gone to help. Like people are talking about all these different types of scenarios, but honestly, if you're ever in that type of situation, which I hope it never comes to that, you just have no idea how you would react and what you would do. DM says that she literally just froze in place and just didn't know what to do. And a lot of psychologists have come out talking about that and they say that that reaction is completely normal. Your body can just go in a state of shock and you might think like, yes, let me try to fight or let me call the police or let me run away or do something. But in that moment, your body can just completely shut down. People do wonder why it took her so long to call the police. And while that is, you know, a good question to ask, I'm sure we'll find out more in the future as to why that happened. But at the end of the day, I honestly think it's because she was just in a complete state of shock. People think that if she had called the police sooner, maybe one of the four victims could have survived. You know, maybe police could have gotten there and, you know, caught the guy sooner and saved their lives. But at the end of the day, the coroner says that even if police had arrived in that moment, there was nothing they could have done to save the girls and Ethan. In fact, Kaylee's father told ABC News in an interview in November that all of the kids died quickly and that they didn't bleed out for hours. So even if they had called 911 earlier, it just wouldn't have saved their kids either way. When he first heard the news about the roommate and about how she had seen a man and had heard people crying and you no know, had witnessed things, he was a little concerned as to why the roommate waited eight hours to call the police. But he called the coroner and asked them, you know, if they had called the police sooner, would my child still be alive? And the coroner said no. So people need to stop blaming the roommates and you know have a little bit of empathy and a little bit of compassion for her because she is probably going through so much and is going to be you know traumatized by this for you know maybe the rest of her life. 
Another victim to public scrutiny was this guy that was seen on camera standing behind the girls at the food truck. So if we look back at the footage, we can see that Kaylee and Madison were ordering food from the grub truck and that standing behind them was this man that was wearing a hoodie and he was kind of just standing behind the girls. He wasn't, you know, talking to them. He wasn't, you know, standing near them as if they had come together. He was just kind of sitting back and a lot of people thought that his behavior was very suspicious and very odd. When the girls get their food and start walking away, this guy kind of gestures at them as if he's, you know, wondering where they're going or as if he's upset that they're leaving. And a lot of people took that and they ran with it and they thought that this guy was a killer and had most likely followed them home and, you know, done this to them. And I understand why people did think that because at first there really wasn't any information about the investigation or about any type of suspect and police were asking for the public to help them identify who this man was. So I understand that his behavior did seem suspicious at first. However, police did eventually find this guy, they interviewed him, and they completely cleared him from having anything to do with the crime. Moscow police literally made a statement saying that this guy was 100% innocent, that he had an alibi, that he wasn't involved in the investigation, yet people didn't listen and they felt like they thought the police were wrong and that they knew more than the police. They literally tore this guy's life apart because they honestly believed that he was guilty and that police had gotten it wrong. Now, while a lot of people did believe that the guy from the food truck was suspicious, other people believed that maybe Kaylee Stalker had done this. A lot of news articles started coming out talking about how Kaylee had a stalker and you know how she was really worried about this and had told her parents and her friends about this stalker and that's when people started to you know theorize you know maybe the stalker did this and Kaylee's family did come out and also talk about this stalker so police started looking into this incident and this is what happened. In mid-October Kaylee had gone to a local business around the area and at the local business two males were seen inside the store. They had parted ways at one point and one of the males appeared to follow Kaylee inside the store and as she exited back to her car. This male turned over to Kaylee but it didn't appear as if he made any contact with her or spoke to her. He just kind of looked at her and you know maybe Kaylee felt off about the situation. Maybe she felt like the guy was following her and that's why she told her parents about this. So police tracked down those two guys and they did speak to them and cleared them of any involvement in the investigation. As for the stalker, police weren't really able to find any evidence to prove that Kaylee did have a stalker. Last but not least, people started to theorize that maybe Kaylee's ex-boyfriend Jack was a killer. The reason they thought this is because the night of the murders, Kaylee had called her ex-boyfriend over seven times. A handful of times from her own cell phone and a couple of times from Maddie's cell phone. At first, people believed that maybe Kaylee had called her ex-boyfriend for help. You know, maybe she saw that she was getting attacked or maybe she saw Maddie getting attacked so she picked up the phone called her ex-boyfriend for help. On the other hand some people thought that maybe she had called the ex-boyfriend invited him over to the house and something bad happened between them and he ended up murdering Kaylee, Maddie, Zanna, and Ethan. People were really going in on this ex-boyfriend. However, police did come out and they said that they have spoken to Jack. They checked his alibi for the night of the murders and they completely cleared him from having anything to do with the investigation. And Kaylee's family said that from the start, they never suspected that Jack was involved. He truly loved Kaylee. And even though they were broken up at the time, they were working on getting back together. They shared the dog Murphy and he just always wanted the best for Kaylee. So it just didn't seem possible to them that Jack would do something this brutal and so horrific. Kaylee's family says that after the murders, Jack literally came to their house. They saw him in person. They checked him for bruises. They checked him for cuts. They checked him for scars. They checked his car. When they thoroughly investigated this guy and they just feel so bad that people were accusing him of doing such horrendous things, even though police had already publicly cleared him. I know we've talked about so many people and about so many topics, but in the end, police cleared the two surviving roommates, DM and BF. They cleared all of the victims' families. They cleared all of their friends. They cleared the ex-boyfriends. They cleared the guy seen at the food truck. They cleared the DoorDash driver. They cleared the private ride service. I mean, they literally dug through every inch of their lives and they cleared all of the people that could have potentially been involved. So at this point, after clearing everybody, the families were feeling 
feeling a bit frustrated. They wondered if police were ever going to catch the killer and they were nervous that this was going to turn into a cold case. But six weeks after Kaylee, Maddie, Zana, and Ethan were murdered, an arrest was finally made. On Friday, December 30th, 2022, the public received shocking news. Police had arrested 28-year-old Brian Kohlberger in connection to the murder. So let's talk a little bit about who Brian Koberger is. Brian was a PhD student studying criminal justice and criminology at Washington State University, which is just less than 10 miles away from Moscow, Idaho. People who knew Brian growing up described him as an anxious, isolated, and depressed teenager who turned to use heroin before eventually getting clean and becoming fascinated with studying criminal psychology, saying that he hoped to one day provide counseling to high-profile criminals. He used to write things about himself on the internet about you know, how he didn't like himself, how he hated himself. He would say things such as, I feel like an organic sack of meat with no self-worth. As I hug my family, I look into their faces and I see nothing. It's like I am looking at a video game, but less. He was a bit heavier when he was growing up, so people say that he used to get bullied because of his weight and because of his appearance, and this just made him be a very depressed teenager. However, as Brian started to get older, he eventually lost the weight, and people said that instead of that making him you no know, happy and making him more friendly and things like that, he actually became a bully. So instead of getting bullied himself, now he was doing the bullying, and he was just very condescending to people, especially when he was speaking to females. He would speak to them in a tone where he was kind of like mansplaining things and would act like you were stupid. He also still had a problem with doing heroin and it just seemed like his life wasn't going well. Brian was born to his two parents and he also has two sisters. He received his bachelor's degree from DeSalle's University in Pennsylvania in 2020 and then he completed his graduate studies there in June of 2022. After that, he moved over to Washington State University where he began getting his PhD in criminology and while Brian was studying for his PhD at Washington State University. He was also an assistant teacher there and lived in an area called Pullman, Washington. And in Pullman, Washington, Brian had actually applied for an internship with the Pullman Police Department. In an essay that he wrote to the Pullman Police Department, he said that he wanted to help rural law enforcement agencies with how to better collect and analyze technological data in public safety operations. He was interviewed for the job, but we're not really sure if he ended up getting the job or if he just never got a call back. So last year in 2022, there was this post made on Reddit from someone who identified himself as Brian Koberger. In this Reddit thread, which I believe has now been deleted, he put out a survey that was targeted for people that had spent time in prison. In the survey, he asked the respondents to describe their thoughts, their emotions, and their actions from the beginning to the end of a crime. So in the survey, he was asking these, you know, criminals how they found their victims, how they decided to target them, how they, you know, got inside their house, you know, how they got rid of evidence, things like that. And obviously as a criminology student or as a criminal justice student, sometimes you do need to, you know, ask these questions and read about these things. So I guess it's not that strange that he did make the survey, but now reflecting back on it and you know, thinking about how he has been accused of committing these murders, it just seems very weird that he was putting out this survey. And it makes a lot of people wonder, you know, if he put this survey out there as a way for him to collect information and data about how other killers were thinking in the moment. Besides just trying to get into the mind of a killer, a lot of people also wonder if he committed these murders because he wanted to be a part of his own investigation. You know, he wanted to be a part of his own study and, you know, maybe see if he could answer these questions for himself. Again, this is all just alleged. We don't know if Brian is actually the killer and these are just things that some people theorize about. So days after Ethan, Zana, Kaylee, and Maddie were murdered, people say that Brian was still on campus. He was still inside his office grading papers and, you know, just acting like nothing had happened. One of his neighbors in Pullman, Washington says that Brian Brian actually spoke to him about the murders. Brian asked his neighbor if he had heard about what happened to the University of Idaho students. And the neighbor said that yes, he heard about what happened to the students. And he also mentioned how there weren't any leads or suspects yet. After saying that, Brian told the neighbor, yeah, seems like they have no leads. Seems like it was a crime of passion. The neighbor says that when they had this conversation, it was literally just a few days after the murder 
partners. You know, now looking back at that, the neighbor is really creeped out thinking that he had that conversation with the alleged killer. So let's talk about what evidence police found against Brian that led to his arrest. So remember how I mentioned that police were looking for a white Hyundai Elantra that may have been involved in the investigation. So police put out that statement about how they were looking for the owner of a white Hyundai Elantra. So a police officer at Washington State University started going around the campus parking lots to see if that car would show up and it did. He ran the license plate and it led him back to Brian Koberger. So after discovering this information, this Washington State police officer handed this information over to the Idaho Police Department. And as soon as they saw a photo of Brian Koberger, they immediately got suspicious. I mean, Brian is a tall, skinny guy. He has, you know, an athletic build and he has bushy eyebrows, which if you remember, that's exactly how the roommate DM described the intruder. She specifically remembered his bushy eyebrows. So when police realized that his features matched the description that DM had given, they began zoning in on Brian. They started following him and his family closely. And a couple of weeks after the murders, Brian was actually stopped by police officers twice. On December 15th, Brian was inside his white Hyundai Elantra with his father, and they were making their way from Washington State University all the way back to their hometown in Pennsylvania. They were going back to celebrate Christmas and New Year's, and I believe Brian had like a fear of flying or something like that. So his father flew to Washington State University to accompany his son across the country and, you know, go back to Pennsylvania. So this was a pre-planned road trip and they were in the white Hyundai Elantra and that's when authorities pulled them over in connection to a traffic stop. Brian was in the passenger seat and the officer stopped him for speeding. There's actually body cam footage of this moment and it's just so crazy to watch this guy literally be inside his car with his dad going back home to celebrate Christmas with his parents and his sister. All the while, this guy could have possibly been the killer. Police stopped him for the speeding, and then nine minutes later, he was stopped by the Indiana State Police for following another vehicle too closely. This part is a little confusing to me because some articles state that these stops were on purpose, that police wanted to stop Brian to see if they could find any scars on him, any bruises, any cuts, you know, anything that could, you know, prove to police that he might have been the killer. So some articles Articles state that these stops were intentional, but other articles state that these stops weren't intentional. So I'm not sure what the accurate statement is. So besides finding out that the white Hyundai Elantra belonged to Brian Koberger and that Brian Koberger fit the description of the man that DM saw the night of the murder, police also found evidence in Brian's phone records to indicate that he was there the night of the murder. So that morning, the night of the killings, Brian's phone had been turned off at 2.47 in the morning. It was turned off for about two hours and it reconnected at 4.48 in the morning. And this time it reconnected to an area near Moscow, Idaho, and then followed a route back to Pullman, Washington, which is where Brian lived. And police believe that Brian shut his phone off from 2.47 in the morning to 4.48 because he didn't want police to track his location and because it would show that he was near the house during that time. So yeah, at 4.48 in the morning, his phone is turned on again. It shows him going back to Pullman, Washington, but then his phone pings a second time back at the house at around nine o'clock in the morning. So this was before police had even been called to the scene because police were called at around 1158 in the morning. So after allegedly committing these murders, Brian then went back to the house, which is so frightening because at this point, DM and BF were probably already awake and were probably already trying to figure out what was going on. They had no idea that the accused killer had come back to the crime scene. Police don't know if maybe he went back to see if the police had been called yet. Maybe he went back to see if there were any witnesses or you know, maybe to look at the crime scene again and see if he had left anything behind. I mean, he did leave the knife sheath behind. So police wonder if he went back to retrieve it. Besides finding that information, police also discovered that Brian Koberger had visited the house at least 12 times before the murder. And all of those times that he was at the house were either late at night or early in the morning. Again, just reading that is so haunting. Just the fact that he was watching this house, that to me is so frightening. And it's just so scary how you never know who's watching you. Police were also able to confirm that the DNA found on the knife sheath is most likely a match to Brian Koberger. On December 27th, police were able to recover DNA from trash that was outside of Brian's parents' home in Pennsylvania. So they retrieved his trash 
stash and with the evidence found on there, they were able to do a test to see if it would match the DNA found on the knife sheath. And when the results came back, it concluded that at least 99.99% of the male population would be expected to be excluded from the possibility of being the suspect's biological father. So that basically means that the DNA found inside the trash belonged to the father of the DNA that was found on the knife sheath. And that trash was taken from Brian's parents' home. So with that information, police felt pretty confident in making an arrest against Brian Koberger. Now some other information has come out that I do just quickly want to mention, but again, I just want you guys to take this with a grain of salt because we don't really know how accurate these statements are. But there have been a couple of sources that claim that Brian followed all three of the girls on Instagram and that apparently he had allegedly DM'd one or more of the girls. Brian's Instagram account is now deleted, but before it was deleted, People Magazine was able to access his account. They looked through his following list and they saw that he followed Maddie, Zana, and Kaylee. And I'm not sure how they got this information, but they were able to speak to someone close to the investigation. And that person revealed that Brian had allegedly messaged one of the girls. They're not sure if the girls even knew Brian existed or if they had met each other at one point. There really isn't that much information about the relationship, if any, between the victims and Brian. So we'll have to wait for police to come out and confirm this information because again, Brian's Instagram is now deleted. So we're not able to verify that information for ourselves. Another statement that has come out is that Brian had visited the restaurant that Maddie and Zayna worked at. They worked at this restaurant called The Mad Greek. And according to an employee that told this to People Magazine, Brian had visited the restaurant at least twice. Brian was a vegan, so he went there to order vegan pizza. And the employee says that they specifically remember Brian because he was being very special about his pizza and just wanted to make sure that no animal products had touched his food. Now, the employee doesn't remember if Brian visited the restaurant while Zana and Maddie were working. So he doesn't know if they had some type of interaction there. And again, this is all according to People Magazine. However, the owner of the restaurant has come out on Facebook. Her name is Jackie Fisher. And she says that People Magazine's report is completely fabricated information and that what the outlet is reporting is not true. So again, that's why I say take everything with a grain of salt because People Magazine is reporting one thing, but the owner of the restaurant is reporting another thing. It's just really hard to know what is actual reality. So again, I would just wait to see if the police comment about this or, you know, more information is going to come out during the trial. So I guess until then, we just have to wait and see what happens. Shortly after arresting Brian, police did seize a number of items from his apartment back in Pullman, Washington. This included one nitrite type black glove, one Walmart receipt with one Dickies tag, two Marshall receipts, dust container from a vacuum, multiple possible hair strands, one possible animal hair strand, two cuttings from uncased pillow of reddish slash brown stains, two top and bottom mattress covers with multiple stains, items with dark red spots, a computer, and a fire TV stick. So for now, Brian faces four counts of first degree murder in the fatal stabbings of Kaylee Gonzalez, Madison Mogan, Zana Kernoodle, and Ethan Chapin. He is scheduled to have his preliminary court hearing in June, where a judge will determine if there is enough evidence to proceed to the trial. So far, from my knowledge, he hasn't entered a plea, but an attorney representing Brian during his extradition from Pennsylvania to Idaho told NBC earlier this month that he believes Brian is going to be exonerated. There also has been a gag order set in place and this basically means that anyone that's involved in the investigation, that means detectives, police officers, judges, lawyers, parents, family members, no one is allowed to publicly reveal details about this investigation and about this trial. That way the integrity of the trial and of the case remains strong so I don't know if we will be getting any more information until his hearing in June. As for the families of Kaylee, Madison, Zana, and Ethan, they are relieved that an arrest has finally been made and they're just hoping that this trial will you know happen swiftly and that everything will go well and that if Brian was the person that did this that he is found responsible and that justice is served to these four young victims. All the families want is justice and I truly hope and pray that they receive that. You know Kaylee, Maddie, Ethan, and Zana did everything right that night. You know they had a buddy system in place. They weren't drinking and driving. They were just trying to go home and get some sleep and you know, this terrible human being had to come inside the house and take their lives away. There have been a couple of memorials and scholarships set up in honor of these four victims, so I will link those down below so you guys can check them out. My thoughts and prayers go out to Maddie's family, to Kaylee's 
family, Zana's family, and to Ethan's family. They are all such incredibly strong people. I don't know how they've been doing this, but they are so strong and every single day they are out there looking for justice for their children and I just truly hope that they get it and I hope that they eventually heal from this. Detectives are still looking for any information that might be of value to the case. So if you know anything, please contact the Moscow Police Department at 208-883-7180 or you can contact them through email at tipline at ci.moscow.id.us. All of that information will be linked down below and if there are ever any updates on this case, I will make sure to let you guys know by putting it in a pinned comment down below or if you guys would like, I can also make a part two if there's more information that comes out leading up to the trial. When Brian went to court for his first appearance, Steve was there and he was literally looking at Brian directly in the eyes, but Brian wouldn't look back at him. All Steve wanted was for Brian to look at him and see his face and look at his eyes. He said, quote, he knows I want him to look me in the eye, so he didn't. He didn't give me that opportunity. He's scared to look at me in the eyes and start to understand what's about to happen to him. You know, he picked the wrong family. We're not scared of conflict. We're not running. We're coming at him. And I feel like that's such a powerful statement that represents how all four families feel. They will not stop until they get justice. All right, you guys, that's pretty much it for today's video. I know there was so much information to go over and there's still so much information. This video could have been like 10 hours long with how much information there is for this case. But definitely let me know if you guys would like me to do a part two in the future. And like I said, my thoughts and prayers go out to all of the families involved. And again, we just need to remember that Kaylee, Maddie, Ethan, and Zana were the victims in this and that the priority has to be them getting justice and their families getting closure. These young kids had their entire life ahead of them. They were so young, so full of life, and they were just getting their lives started. And it's just absolutely heartbreaking how someone had to take all of that away from them. I would love to know what you guys think about this case down below and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye guys.